everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Happy Monday evening to you. Hey, we're gonna be diving into one of the most common questions that we get, which is, you know what, I've been eating gluten my whole life. Why am I reacting now? Why haven't I not been reacting in the past? Why all of a sudden did the symptoms set on? And I hear it from 50 year olds and 60 and 70 year olds and 30 year olds and 25 year olds. So it's a common question. Again, it's why did I start reacting to gluten when I have this long history of being able to consume it without any major side effects? So we're going to talk tonight about the top 11 gluten trigger accelerators. And so ultimately, I think it's important for you to understand these are not what cause gluten sensitivity. Gluten sensitivity is genetic. And, you know, we'll just do a quick mini course uh, in that regard, let's back up a little bit here. Um, it's important that you understand how gluten sensitivity actually works before we get into some of these triggers, because these triggers are accelerants. They're like the gas pedal, but they're not necessarily the cause. So I want to differentiate that because some of you are going to have this potential attitude that, hey, maybe for me, this isn't the problem. For me, it, it's something entirely different. So. Let's, um, let's do this. Let's make some room here and let's talk about gluten sensitivity. So first understand that gluten sensitivity largely, for the most part, it's a genetic predisposition. You either have the genes or you don't. That's why I always harp on genetic testing as, as the primary way or agent in which you can discover whether or not you should cut gluten and other grains out of your diet. So. This genetic predisposition has to do with your cells, and on the surface of your cells, you have this receptor called an HLA-DQ receptor. Now, there's there's two parts to this receptor. Let's let's color coordinate it here. There's one arm of the receptor, and then there's a second arm of the receptor coming off the sides. But the receptor itself is structured or looks uh, looks like a Y um, that sits off the surface of your cell. So if this is the cell, this is your genetic you know, your DNA, your nucleus, right? And so you have an, a couple of genes that code for this receptor, if you will. And so what happens is if gluten sits into that receptor, it's going to trigger an inflammation or an inflammatory response. And this is done in multiple ways. We know the immune system can, can trigger the release or production of different chemicals like cytokines. We also know that um, this response can generate antibodies. And that's why some people, when they go get tested, they're positive on their antibody tests. And some people aren't positive on their antibody tests because they're not making antibodies, they're making inflammatory cytokines instead. And so again, there's multiple mechanisms of reaction here, but ultimately the genetic predisposition is the part you need. You need to have this genetic predisposition coming from the HLA-DQ genes. There's two of them. There's an alpha one and there's a beta one arm. And so again, the alpha one and the beta one arms are these two color-coded pieces. So if you have genetic predisposition and you come into contact with gluten, this inflammatory response is gonna happen. Now, what we know is that there are things that will accelerate this inflammatory response and make it more obvious. And that's what we're gonna really be discussing tonight. So again, as we, as we dive into tonight's show, I want you to keep what I just said in mind. So the first major accelerator is lack of breastfeeding. Now, I, I will say that, that formula feeding is, it, you know, unless you have no other option, okay? I get it if you aren't producing milk. So this is, not, I'm not trying to mother shame any moms who didn't, didn't breastfeed their children, okay? So no shaming here. However, it's one of the worst things that you can do depending on the formula that you're using. Formula, uh, for most, these, these common formulas you buy in the grocery store, the ones that the pediatricians dole out and say, hey, this is good for your baby, um, they're, they're toxic garbage. We'll just make it real simple. They're toxic garbage. You may not have known that when you were breastfeeding and you were just trying to make it happen, but formula is toxic garbage. It has no place being served to our children. It's one of the reasons why we have the vast health epidemic today that we do. But breastfeeding is super critical to the development of the baby's immune system. So we need that 
let's change this color. We're, we're too Easter looking. Let's, let's go back to something more legible. Um, for immune development, the baby needs that breast milk not only for immune development, but for immune protection. Um, there are a number of agents in mom's breast milk that protect the baby and help it is regulate that immune system and develop that immune system. So breastfeeding becomes a very, very important part of, or lack of breastfeeding becomes an important accelerator, if you will, of reaction to gluten. Now let's, let's just, a couple things here. So let's look at what is in most baby formulas, right? And we're talking about the top five ingredients here. We're not talking about there's a little bit of sugar in formula. We're talking about the number one ingredient in, in most baby formulas that I've looked at on the market today are these top three, corn, maltodextrin, corn syrup, and sugar. Now ask yourself this question. There's a, there's a, there's a common rule. I call it one of the cardinal rules of nutrition, which is very simply put, you can't get healthy eating food that's not healthy. How healthy you know, quiz, how healthy is it to pump your baby full of sugar, corn syrup, and maltodextrin as the primary agent of caloric load during the most pivotal times when their brains are developing, when their livers are developing, when their kidneys are developing? It's a horrific thing to do. And then you tap into some of these other things like the genetically modified soy oil and the corn derivative xanthan gum, right? Formulas, I mean, and then all the synthetic vitamins, they're just junk. Now, now add to that this right here. So the effect of breastfeeding on the risk of celiac disease. So this was a meta-analysis review done. And the conclusion was that breastfeeding offers protection against the development of celiac disease. Increasing duration of breastfeeding was associated with reduced risk of developing a gluten issue. So we know that not breastfeeding increases that risk. And maybe one of the reasons not breastfeeding does it isn't necessarily because the baby's not being breastfed, but maybe it's because of what is in the formula. And maybe it's both. I don't think anybody's ever studied that combination separately, right? But I think we have to look at it and we have to use the, the common sense radar, which unfortunately in today's world is, has gone out the window. But we have to look at our own good judgment and say, okay, yeah, it's probably not a good thing to feed my baby more than 50% of the calories from genetically modified syrup derived from corn and other sugars. It's a bad idea. And, you know, compound that with the common knowledge that God gave women a gift, the gift to make this miraculous food, right, that transfers from breast to baby and allows for baby to achieve and receive all the nutrition, right? All the things that are there are already perfect. And so, and so in, that, in that regard, breastfeeding should be held in high regard, right, by our medical communities. But instead, our medical communities have tried to convince decades of, of young women that, that somehow this swill is better than the God-given formula that you have in your body. So again, breastfeeding is one of, lack of breastfeeding uh, and formula induction is one of those accelerators. Now, to that same note, we said formula, one of the biggest ingredients is sugar. So we're going we're gonna to tackle several of the accelerators here. And one of, you know, again, sugar being one of them here. But sugar does what? Sugar, when you overconsume sugar, okay, that's going to create an imbalance in the microbiome. It's going to feed yeast. Now, we all have what's called a myco. M-Y-C-O, mycobiome, myco is fungal or yeast, right? So this refers to the yeast. Now, so, so it's an important to understand that some yeast is normal, but a yeast overgrowth is abnormal. And so an e, a yeast overgrowth oftentimes leads to symptoms specifically in the sinuses and in the lungs. These are symptoms of what's known as oftentimes referred to as an upper respiratory infection or URI. And so a lot of times kids, parents, their kids are stuffy. They've got, you know, they've got uh, severe congestion, right? They're coughing, they're wheezing, sneezing, etc. They go to the doctor. How many, how many of you have ever been to a doctor with your child and they just said, oh, no testing needed. Let's just do antibiotics. Just if that's happened to you, just type antibiotics into the comment section right now. If you've ever been taking your child to the doctor, they didn't do any testing or differentiation for fungal or yeast infection versus bacterial infection and just put you on antibiotics or just put your child on antibiotics. Now, the problem with that is antibiotics are not harmless. So you go to the doctor, you have a, an upper respiratory infection that's being caused by yeast. You take an antibiotic, 
the yeast overgrowth gets worse. So one of the top causes of yeast overgrowth is the use of antibiotics, right? And so that's why it's so important here, if, if this is happening to you, that you get differentiation. Because if you don't, you can make the actual problem worse. And I'll show you in just a minute. There's a lot of research that shows that, that this is a major problem. So you get yeast overgrowth is worse, right? And then you have to understand that yeast creates a protein that can mimic gluten. So it's an accelerator. It's a mimicker. It's one of the things. It's, it's called a hyphal wall protein that can actually mimic gluten. And so again, going back to what I showed you a moment ago, if, if your body's HLA-DQ receptor, okay, identifies this yeast protein that looks just like gluten, then instead of that gluten sitting into that receptor, that yeast protein will sit in that receptor. It will cause the same response, that inflammatory response. So it's important to understand that yeast overgrowth has been shown to cause gluten reactivity, which is why it's a bad thing for anybody with gluten sensitivity issues to have a yeast overgrowth. So you see here a couple of research studies, mechanisms by which Antibiotics increase the incidence and severity of candidiasis. Candidiasis is just a form of yeast overgrowth and alter the immunological defenses. Now, this study is not a new study. Uh, this study was published in 1966. Why do I bring up an old study? A lot of people say, well, that's an old study, Dr. Osborne. It doesn't mean anything. Bull. An older study, this is what this means, is we've known this at least since 1966. So what this tells you is your doctor has zero excuses to say, ah, we didn't know it, right? This is information that's been around since the 60s. So what, is, what, is, what do we see here? Patients on antibiotics experience proliferation of candida albicans in the alimentary canal is no longer a point for dispute. That's the summary in the introduction of this study. It's no longer a point of dispute. We know it happens, okay? Now, is, here's another study published in Lancet. This is somewhat newer, 2003, okay, so fast track almost 40 years in, in time ahead, right? And so then you have these guys saying, uh, candida albicans a trigger in the onset of celiac disease, the virulence factor of candida albicans, hyphal wall protein contains amino acid sequences that are identical or highly homologous, meaning similar, okay, to known celiac disease related alpha gliadin, gamma gliadin T cell epitopes. What does, that, what does that mean in English? That means that the hyphal wall protein, the protein that's produced by candida albicans, looks just like the gluten proteins that trigger celiac disease. And so you can get a problem, right? A celiac disease manifestation as a result of a yeast overgrowth. But again, going back to this here, we start life out eating baby formula loaded with sugar, causing yeast overgrowth, leading to infection that's not bacterial in nature, but it's fungal in nature. So the antibiotics increase and make the problem worse, creating a bigger issue around candidiasis, which leads to gluten mimicry. And again, we get gluten acceleration. So where we'll see a lot of that sometimes is we'll see somebody to go through a period of their life where they're being pounded with antibiotics. Just, you know, I took five antibiotics this year. I took eight antibiotic rounds of antibiotics this year for upper frequent upper infections, respiratory infections that my doctor gave me. I see this a lot in my practice, and one of the questions I ask is, did they, did they do a culture? Did they do a culture to determine whether it was bacterial or fungal? And I've never heard somebody say, yeah, my doctor did a culture and differentiated. So I've been practicing 21 years. I've never heard a doctor do their job, and that's not to say there aren't doctors out there that do their job, that's just saying that's my experience. And the next acceleration factor is pesticides. And we'll hear this a lot. I, I get this a lot. People say, oh, it's not gluten, Dr. Osborne. Gluten is fine. We don't react to gluten. It's the glyphosate. It isn't just the glyphosate. And I want to be very, very clear about that. I'm not saying that glyphosate is not playing a major role. Of course it is. You can't eat poison that damages the GI tract and disrupts the flora and expect a healthy outcome. We know now that glyphosate is link, linked to lymphoma, okay, which is a cancer. And in animal studies, it's linked to all kinds of different cancers and problems. But in humans now, we know this is a lawsuit that came out of California a few years ago proving this. And so pesticides, 
You know, if you look at most grains, particularly wheat and corn, they're sprayed heavily with glyphosate, at, you know, at the, at the front end, but also on the tail end. Uh, the glyphosate is used as a drying agent to dry and desiccate out the crop to make it easier to bring to market, make it easier to combine. So, but here's what we know about glyphosate use. So there's a, Dr. Sinef from MIT actually put this together. So I, I can't, don't credit me with this chart. We'll credit her with that. But they, her and her partners, um, Dr. Samsel put together this corollary between glyphosate use, right? And the increased incidence of the development of celiac disease. And they found an alarming trend. You can see this black line that goes through this graph. We'll make it a little bit bigger just so that you can see it. Here we go. Um, you see there's this huge trend since the early 1990s all the way up, and it goes all the way up to 2010, this, this curve that skyrockets, right, as a, as, a, as a corollary with glyphosate use. Now, again, in, in, in real science, we can't say that the correlation is causation, but this is something that really needs to be looked at in, in much greater depth. And, and, but the number one thing that you can do, right, the best intelligent thing you can do is don't eat poison, right? I mean, that's not, let's, let's, just, let's just not call it rocket science. It's not that complicated. Uh, when you eat poison, you, you, you know, there are different gradients of poison. And if you eat small amounts of poison all the time, then you're just slowly making yourself sicker as time goes on, regardless of whether it's inducing or causing gluten sensitivity, it's still poisoning you. Um, but we also know that some of the other stuff, so we're not talking about glyphosate, like some of the other pesticides, for example, um, atrazine, probably one of the more common ones. Astra, atrazine, it's an, it's, a, it's an estrogen mimicking, so it mimics or it increases estrogen activity, so it mimics it, right? So, and what do we see with increases you know, astronomically high increases in estrogen. I, I've shown you this before. Some studies show that we get increased permeability of the gut lining. Um, so, so, you know, that's where you, you may have some concern with excessive estrogen, aside from the fact that excessive estrogen mimicking substances increase cancer and can disrupt the endocrine system and create lots of other problems, not just, not just an increased risk for the development of gluten reactivity. Now let's move on to meat glue. Meat glue I've talked about before, but meat glue, um, also known as microbial transglutaminase. So this is the stuff, it's like a, it's, it's, a, it's a fine powder when they use it and they mix it into your food to make it sticky, to make it gluey, right? To make it adhere. And they use it a lot in fake meat. You see it in steak. Like, and, and not all restaurants do this, but, but many do. And this is where you're going to most commonly come into contact with this stuff is that you go out to eat. Um, when you go out to eat, restaurants will serve you the cheapest junk and charge you the most amount of food, right? And so we'll see this particularly in like chicken. Um, when you think you're getting a chicken breast and it actually tastes like a hot dog, that's meat glue chicken breast. It's not an actual chicken breast. And they don't have to disclose meat glue as an ingredient in the, in the food. So you, you flip at, at the label and look at the ingredient list. It doesn't have to say meat glue or, trans, you know, tissue, or microbial transglutaminase, rather. And so this is something that's found a lot uh, as a thickening agent. We see it in, in confections, uh, dessert-based products. We see it in dairy-based products. We see it in meat based products, but we know that meat glue actually increases gluten reactivity. And so here's, again, here's a, a couple of studies to just show you one on meat glue itself. So you see MTG, that's meat glue. MTG stands for microbial transglutaminase. So the MTG treatment increased reactivity to wheat and maize, maize is corn, prolamines, prolamines is a type of gluten. So wheat and corn glutens in patients with celiac disease. So we know that treating uh, food with meat glue increase the reactivity to the proteins in the food. And this isn't the only study. We didn't have time to get into the full on. I could have talked for 17 hours tonight, uh, talked all the way into the morning. But I wanted to just show you, um, this is not anecdote. This is not me just saying, hey guys, uh, meat glue's bad for you. This has actually been researched and really well studied. And then we have processed food additives even beyond meat glue, because food additives, meat glue is a food additive, but there are other food additives, and I think it's important. This is why I always talk about eating organically, right? But you can see here, tight junction 
leakage is enhanced by many luminal components. Luminal components, that refers to things in your, in your gut. Commonly used industrial food additives being some of them. Glucose, salt, so that goes back, glucose is what? Sugar, which we talked about a minute ago, salt. Emulsifiers, emulsifier, that's what meat glue is, right? It's a type of emulsifier. Organic solvents, gluten, microbial transglutaminase, again, meat glue. Okay, and then nanoparticles are extensively and increasingly used by the food industry. Okay, all of the aforementioned additives increase intestinal permeability by breaching the integrity of tight junction paracellular transfer. What does that mean? That's just a fancy way of saying all of these things cause leaky gut. And when you get leaky gut, what happens next for most of you, if it's there long enough, autoimmune disease develops. And the average, we gotta remember, celiac is autoimmune, and that's why there's a, all this linkage to, to gluten and celiac, but there are more than 100 forms of autoimmune disease. It's the number one cause of death in women under the age of 65. The average person who develops one form of autoimmune disease will develop, go on and develop six more in their lifetime. So you don't want this, right? You don't want this. So how do we avoid it? Well, we eat real food. Real simple, eating real food. A lot of us, um, when we're first going gluten free, are so overwhelmed by the prospect of eating real food because if we follow that standard American diet, real food is, is kind, of, kind of part of our diet, but also so is a lot of fake food. And so it's that transition that can be very, very challenging for many. So don't let that overwhelm you. If, you, if you're watching this today and you're, and you're seeing this information and you're freaking out in your chair, just like take deep breaths, calm down, one step at a time, right, and, and start tackling this. All right, so another gluten accelerator are medicines, particularly, I, we talk about several, but medications, many medications in general, and so pain and blood pressure medicines are common. There's actually, with pain medicines, we know there's a class of, of pain medicines over the counter and prescription called NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, right? And then there's also steroids. And we know that both of these types of medicines cause gut damage. Leaky gut, permeability. And this is a big one. I get this a lot where somebody's been taking, you know, mega doses of non-steroidals. We're talking like 1,600 milligrams of ibuprofen a day. Um, and their gut's being damaged to such a great degree. I've actually seen people have surgical resection of parts of their intestine or colon as a result of taking pain medicines, right? These benign things that you got to understand that aspirin by itself, not even include aspirin is an NSAID, but aspirin by itself killed 13,000 people last year properly taken. It causes um, gastric damage at one tenth the dose of a baby aspirin and you add NSAIDs and steroids to that, especially if you're taking them together. If you're taking an NSAID along with a steroid, when they're working together, it's eight times the damage to your gut than when they're working alone. So it's a, they're, they're synergistic together at damaging your GI tract. Then we also have um, some blood pressure medicines. Interestingly enough, there's one class of blood pressure medicine. There are about 107 or so studies that have proven this. But if you take a blood pressure medicine called an ARB, that stands for angiotensin receptor blocker, ARB, um, this class of medication, usually if, if the blood pressure medicine that you're on ends in A-R-T-A-N, like Olmosartan, A-R-T-A-N is the last several letters of the drug, that's typically an ARB. So if you're not sure what an ARB is, you never heard of that, just look at the medicine and if the last five letters are A-R-T-A-N, you, you may wanna ask your doctor, is it an ARB? Because these medicines have actually been shown to cause villus atrophy. So they actually, there, were, there was a case, it was actually Mayo published, Mayo Clinic published on this a few years ago, uh, of a gentleman taking this medication. He got a diagnosis of celiac disease, and he didn't really have celiac disease. He had this drug-induced damage, and it had caused him to develop villus atrophy. So, um, so again, these medications can do it. Now, other medications, as I mentioned earlier, antibiotics are a medication. Right, antibiotics can also induce or increase 
or accelerate the reactivity toward gluten. So it's not just pain medicines, it's not just blood pressure medicines. Uh, there are other medicines as well. Antacids fall in that, in that category of medicines that can accelerate it. But um, this is another medicine, although it's typically not considered. I get probably get kicked off of Facebook and YouTube for even bringing it up today. Um, but I'm going to bring it up nonetheless because I think it's important to educate you guys. And that's the HPV, human papillomavirus vaccine. Now, human papillomavirus um, vaccines have been around for a number of decades. And these are, are some of the probably the most side effect driven vaccines that we've seen in modern times, uh, minus the most recent one. But, um, but this vaccine was a major study published. We'll just move to the research on this. Um, you can see here that HPV, human papillomas vaccination of adult women in risk of autoimmune and neurological disease. And this is what they found in this study. This was a study done um, by looking at more than 3 million people. So this is not a small scale type of trial. This is a very large trial, but here's what they found. We identified seven adverse events with statistically significant increased risks following vaccination. One was Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is autoimmune thyroid disease. Two is celiac disease, localized lupus erythematosus, pemphigus vulgaris, Addison's disease, Raynaud's disease, and other encephalitis, myelitis, and encephalomyelitis. Um, so this is what they found. Now, kind of another summary down here. This is just a quote taken from the study. In our study, approximately half of all celiac cases occurring after vaccination occurred within one year of the first dose, to our knowledge. No previous study has linked HPV vaccine and celiac disease. So again, this is the first study of its kind to look for this. This was done and published in the Journal of Internal Medicine in 2018. So again, there definitely is a linkage between medicines, uh, and in this case, the vaccine and the development of gluten reactivity. So next, don't hate me. Don't shoot the messenger. I know a lot of you... Um, this is your kind of your morning routine. Most of America, most of you know, most of the world, um, milk and coffee. And so, um, I want to be clear that that um, coffee is gluten free, unless you're drinking one of these um, one of these like powdered coffees that oftentimes they sweeten it with like a barley or a malt. But so, like your instant coffees. A lot of times they'll have hidden gluten in them in the form of barley and malt, and you have to be real careful with that. And then milk has its, some of its own problems because there, there's a protein found in milk called casein, especially A1 casein, that can mimic, mimic gluten and create that same kind of damage. So let's, let's look at that here. So this was published in 2007 from the Journal of Trans, uh, Translational Immunology. And so you can see here... Uh, their patients, they did a study on patients with, with celiac disease with cow's protein, okay? And you see this, the topic of the study is mucosal reactivity to cow's milk protein and celiac disease. And so in these patients, as so I say, 10 of these 20 patients showed a similarly strong inflammatory reaction to cow's milk challenge. Six of the cow's milk sensitive patients were challenged with specific cow milk protein, including casein and alkyl, alpha lacto, lactalbumin. Casein, in contrast to alpha lactalbumin, induced an inflammatory response similar to that produced by cow's milk, a mucosal inflammatory response similar to that elicited by gluten was produced by cow's milk protein in half, 50% of the patients with celiac disease that were studied in this study. So casein in particular seems to be involved in this reaction. So why, why does this matter? Because casein um, is in milk, it's in dairy, it's in cheese, right? And so a lot of, a lot of um, you know, you get a diagnosis of gluten sensitivity or celiac disease, a lot of the doctors will tell you, oh, you eat all the dairy you want, don't worry about it. But here we have this, you know, and this isn't the only study of its kind that has shown this, but in this particular study, half, 50% of participants studied reacted to casein. Now, what some people believe is that this is, um, the reason for this is there's a type of casein called A1 casein, which is um, uh, a lot more potentially detrimental than A2 casein. A2 casein. So what's the difference? What's the difference between A1 and A2? It's the genetics of the cow producing the casein, producing the milk itself. And if you don't know that difference or if that difference isn't on the product that you're purchasing, uh, I, would, I would encourage you to go back and watch my gluten versus dairy series um, that, that I did a while back and get better enlightened on, 
on that uh, that difference. Okay, let's take your questions because I got through all the things I wanted to get through tonight. So let's let's get through some of your questions. All right. Um, is it? I'm doing a heavy metal detox. Um, is it okay to add or drink plain celery juice every day during that time? Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Um, unless you're allergic to celery juice, I don't see that that would really be all that big of an issue. Um, what's the best supplement for, for blotting or clotting? Oh, bloating. Okay, so blotting. I, I would, Chantel, I assume you mean bloating and not blotting or clotting because I don't know what blotting is and I, don't, I know what clotting is. But um, anyway, maybe, maybe there's a just a misspell or a typo there. It, but I'm going to assume you mean bloating, and I'm going to answer it that way. So best, the best thing to do digestion-wise for bloating is, number one, is to isolate and identify um, what's causing it. And so that could be any number of different types of food. For a lot of people, the bloating comes, if we're keeping to tonight's topic, from a yeast overgrowth. So if you have yeast overgrowth in your GI tract, uh, what will cause excessive bloating typically is, is any type of uh, carbohydrates as a general rule of thumb. That's why the FODMAP diet is popular. FODMAPs are carbohydrates. And, um, and so that oftentimes will be a trigger for individuals bloating is a yeast overgrowth because yeast take any kind of carbohydrates that you eat and they'll ferment them. And a byproduct of that is gas, which is going to cause that intestinal bloating. Now, beyond that, there are other causes. You could be a low stomach acid producer. You could be, uh, you could have low digestive enzyme levels. And so in that regard, taking a digestive enzyme like my Ultra Digest, you might find to be very helpful. Um, if, if you, if you um, again, if you want to take digestive support, another a supplement that we carry is called Ultra Acid, which also might be very helpful if you're a low stomach acid producer to assist you in your digestion. Um, let's see here. Will histocyst stop ringing of the ears? It, 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 you know, I wouldn't say that. That wouldn't be the thing I would say, oh, you have ringing of the ears? Take this. Um, I would first question why you have ringing of the ears, and, and that's, that's probably too deep of a concept or topic to get into tonight because we could talk a few hours about, about different reasons why that can happen. What are the, difference between, what, what are the differences experienced between... Oh, question didn't don't look like they finished asking. Right here. Oh, okay. Oh, being homozygous and heterozygous for HLA-DQ2. Um, okay, good question. So homozygous means same. Heterozygous means different. If you're homozygous for DQ2, so let's, let's pull up my diagram here and we'll get that question answered. How many slides do we got to go back? Let's see. Here we go. I think we're coming to it now. Okay. So as I, as I said earlier, so so this HLA DQ, there's actually two genes. There's an alpha one and a beta one. And so the alpha one has two alleles. So, so one allele from the mom, so it has two alleles. That's an A. Um, one from mom and one from dad. So, so like we say this top one is from dad, and again, this bottom one is from mom. And so if they're both the same, meaning let's say your, your dad had an HLA DQ2 and your mom had a DQ2 and they both gave you a DQ2, then your alpha one gene is homozygous for DQ2. Homo again, meaning the same. If you only inherited one DQ1 from your dad and, and from your mom, maybe you got a DQ1 or something, you know, just it doesn't matter, something different, then now you are heterozygous for DQ2, meaning you have half uh, of your gene, one of your alleles or half of that gene is a DQ2. So that's basically what that means. Now, is one worse than the other as it relates to reacting to gluten? Um, 
it, it matters if you're talking about the risk for the, the development of celiac disease, there's a, a, a greater propensity toward the development of celiac disease if you're homozygous for DQ2 than if you're just heterozygous for DQ2. But I haven't seen in our research, and we've done thousands and thousands and thousands of these tests on individuals where there's a huge difference whether you're homo or heterozygous as it relates to how severely you're going to react to gluten. We see kind of the same severity of reactions to gluten whether a person's homo or heterozygous. Um, what's the jello-like blob of translucent stuff on the surface of an eye? Uh, it's probably a pterygium. Um, PT starts with a PT, pterygium, the, the P is silent. And that's a, a common growth that can occur on the eye. There are a lot of different reasons why that can happen, but that may be what you're talking about. There are other growths certainly that can occur on the eye, but pterygium is the most common. And generally they're benign unless they're growing into your field of vision. Uh, I can't use coconut except for coconut oil, water, or milk. Can't tolerate the meat. The shreds, unfortunately. So where's the question in that? Don't see a question in that. What's the experience differences between, okay. I think I answered that one. Do insufficient levels of pancreatic enzymes facilitate the development of celiac disease or does celiac disease cause pancreatic insufficiency? I think that's a great question, and I, in my experience, what we'll see, what we'll say is that gluten sensitivity causes pancreatic insufficiency and damage. Um, it puts damage; it, it can damage the pancreas. I actually just published a major article on malabsorption. If you go visit Gluten Free Society and look at one of our most recent blog posts, it's a very research-backed piece. You can read more about pancreatic insufficiency associated with gluten exposure, um, and not vice versa. Generally, some the pancreas pan, remember the pancreas has to have a reason why it's become insufficient, why it's not producing, and so gluten can be one of those reasons for that damage. Certainly, there can be other reasons, but um, I would say it, it goes more along the lines of gluten induces the pancreatic problem and not the other way around. Can stress bring in gluten sensitivity and is there a President's Day discount or promo code? There's not a President's um, Day promo code that I, that I think we have, although I think we're right now if you use the promo code OMEGA and you're looking for high quality omega uh, fatty acid supplementation, there's a sale going on right now for our omega fats. Um, let's see here. Does gluten pass through to breast milk? Angelia wants to know. Yes, it does. There's actually been a few studies that show that in humans that um, gluten can pass through to the breast milk. And so this is where a lot of times if the baby's gluten sensitive and the mom is eating gluten, breast milk is still a better option than formula milk. But if that baby's gluten sensitive, you could also be passing that gluten down to the baby. So it's important to know if your baby's gluten sensitive you know, you would want to eat gluten-free while you were breastfeeding for sure to prevent that from happening. Um, it hasn't been studied in other animals, to my knowledge. I haven't seen any research that shows that gluten as a protein passes through, for example, cow's milk. Cows are very different, right? They have four uh, chambers of their stomach, um, and whereas humans have one. And so, so there's, there are definitely some differences there. I don't think we could say one, with one species it's the same as with another, not until we can get better confirmation. But... That is, that is what some, some researchers speculate might be the problem with dairy, with many types of dairy, is that there's this, there's this possibility, unstudied albeit, that, that that could be the case. And that's why so many people go gluten-free, also go dairy-free, before they get to a real resolution of their gastric problems or of their systemic disease. Uh, so again, can stress bring in gluten sensitivity? I think I missed the first half of that question. Stress can absolutely be one of the accelerating triggers. Stress is an accelerating trigger for all disease, not just um, reactivity to gluten, because stress causes disruption of the microbiome. Stress causes micronutrient deficiency. Stress puts your body in a state of hypersympathetic tone, which means that your gut's going to work less effective. You're going to sleep, your sleep is going to suffer. So it, it, it induces a lot of major problems. And, and that's not acute stress so much as it is chronic stress. 
Um, why do, do we need vitamin K with vitamin D3? I, I read that without K2, it, um, vitamin D can cause calcification of the arteries. Not, not necessarily. That's all kind of conjecture. You're, you'll see a lot of that on the internet. Um, look, I've seen thousands of people that I've put on vitamin D that it didn't put them on vitamin K2. And I think if you're guessing, it's not a bad idea to take D with K2. It's not a bad idea. It's just, you know, taking them together ensures that that, that won't be a problem. But, you know, in my clinic, we test people. So there's never a guess. If you're not deficient in vitamin K2, um, but you are deficient in vitamin D, there's no need to give both. We give one or the other uh, based on the person's unique outcome or results as opposed to just saying everybody that takes it should take them both. I don't, I don't think we can make that statement or that claim and be accurate. Okay. A lot of commentary on the antibiotics. So a lot of you were, were yeah, totally told uh, to take the antibiotic without having the, the culture done. Let's see. What do you think, um, let's see, what order do you think cleanses should be in? Kidney, liver, colon, and parasite cleanse. Do you think everyone should do at least one parasite cleanse in life? No. Um, and I don't think there's a, there's a special order. I mean, most will tell you that the cleansing the colon is number one. Cleansing out the gut is number one. Um, if you're trying to do it all in a specific order. But here's the reality of cleanses. Your body is a filter. Your liver filters all the time. Your kidneys filter all the time. Your intestines and colon filter all the time. Your lungs filter all the time. Your skin filters all the time. They don't do it in order. They do it in their order. They do it of their own volition based on what they're being exposed to. And I think, I think people rely too heavily on cleanses and not heavily enough on behavior. Right? And if you have good behaviors that match who you are biochemically as an individual, if you eat well and you don't subject yourself to poisons and toxins on the regular and lie to yourself that those things that you're subjecting you to aren't poisons, I think you don't need to worry or focus on having to do cleanses all the time. I think cleanses are, for most people, are, are a crutch that they use to say, this is the way I'm gonna start and become successful right, and my health, but where you really have to start to be successful in your health is start by promising not to hurt yourself anymore. And that means through your behaviors. And so once you change your behaviors, your kidneys, your liver, your lungs, your, your organs will love you and they can repair and they can recover when you no longer feed them poison or expose them to poisons. And that doesn't necessarily require a ton of cleansing. Uh, that's why, I mean, the cleansing market, don't get me wrong, the supplement cleansing market's a billion dollar industry and, and some people will swear by it. But what I see time and time again, it's not to say cleanse can't be helpful, but don't rely on the cleanse if you haven't changed your behavior, because if that's the case, you're just going to, basically you're using a cleanse the way a doctor uses a drug. You're using the cleanse for symptomatic reduction without ascertaining the origin of why your problem exists. And that's just, just a bad place to be in your health. Let's see, Dennis informed me there's likely an infection in an old crown with a root canal, only one I've had, referring me to endodontist for retreatment. I know these infections can be problematic systemically, but no biological dentist near me. So where's the question in that? My input on that would be, you know, you, you need to find a biological dentist. I'd say get, get, you, um, get you the right type of x-ray they do, a, or image called a cone beam so that you can ascertain whether or not that thing is infected. Because if it's infected, you know, there are a number of different types of treatments that a good environmental dentist or biological dentist can implement. And so I would, I'd certainly I would get with one because if you go, it's, it's kind of like going to standard medicine. If you're looking for a doctor like me, um, well, let me reframe that. If you're looking for a doctor like me, but instead you go like a general practitioner, you're not gonna be happy if you're looking for a doctor like me and vice versa, right? If you're looking for standard practitioner and you come to a doctor like me, you're not gonna be happy. And I think ultimately, if you, if you have a problem in your tooth and you go to an endodontist, you may not be happy with that type of recommendation that you might get coming from that type of dentist or doctor. 
um, simply because philosophically it's not a good fit for who you are. It might be worth doing a little bit more research to find an environmental dentist. There's a great website, IAOMT.org. And this website um, is a has a database of different uh, trained environmental and biological dentists. And so I don't, I don't know if you've looked there, but hopefully you haven't, and that is helpful as a resource for you. Um, let's see, Linda's asking about options to ARBs. There, there are a lot of other options. That, you know, the, at the end of the day, you have to talk to your, to your prescribing doctor. I mean, ARB is one style or one class of blood pressure medicine. There's, there's calcium channel blockers, there's ACE inhibitors, there's diuretics. So there's multiple classes of blood pressure medicines, and so you just have to have that conversation. Uh, protonics, can protonics cause leaky gut? It sure does. It, it, protonics blocks stomach acid production, and that is one of the things that allows for bacteria that don't belong in your intestine to make it into your intestine and create um, barrier breaches that, again, barrier breaches, a.k.a. leaky gut. What damage can years of cow's milk drinking do? Um, depends on the person. Um, but I, I would say no damage done to your body has, to, you don't have to think of any of that damage as a permanent fixture in your life. You, this is where, again, you have to evolve the strength to make the changes today. Your body has a miraculous ability to heal despite the past damage or trauma that you've done to it through eating, etc. And so you've, you've got to make changes today to get to that. Is organic almond and coconut milk okay? Um, no carrageenan gum as a thickener. Yeah, I mean, they're okay. They're okay as a general rule, provided, again, you're not reacting to almonds and not reacting to coconut. But yeah, as far as gluten is concerned, I mean, what you got to be worried about in the other, in the, in the milks, in the, the, the plant milks, if you will, they're not really truly milks, but it's a lot of the fillers. So just read your filler list. And if your filler list are all real foods that you can pronounce and you know what they are and they're all generally good for you, then I don't, I don't think you're, you're falling too astray there. Thoughts on lipomas. Um, so for most people, lipomas are accumulations of fat deposits underneath the skin. They're relatively benign, but really they're, they can be kind of a um, kind of an insight into an, a, a bigger problem. And so, and so there are a few different problems with lipomas. One is if you have lipomas, you shouldn't drink alcohol because alcohol can contribute to lipoma formation. Increases in blood sugar can increase um, lipoma formation because excessive blood sugar converts into fat, and that can end up as fatty deposits on you, in you, under your skin. Liver damage. Also, so I would I would suggest if you've got a lot of lipoma and you don't know why and it's happened rather suddenly, you look at these three areas first and just make sure you're doing things right. Um, what's the best natural remedy for severe osteoporosis? Um, natural, finding out what you're deficient in, Valerie. So if you don't know what you're low in, so your bones require, a lot of people, a lot of doctors are, are super guilty of this because they, study, they don't study nutrition. So they say, just take calcium, right? And calcium, although it's important for your bones to be mineralized, it's only one of many minerals. You need magnesium and zinc and selenium and boron and strontium and vanadium. And so if you haven't had those things checked or tested, then, you know, natural remedy-wise, you, you want to understand what you're lacking nutritionally that helps your body or assists your body in mineralizing your bone. Protein, too. A lot of people are protein malnourished, but, but one of the big things, too, as well, Valerie, there are two other things I would suggest. One is low exercise or not doing weight resistance activity. Bone grows on, based on pressure, so if you're not applying daily gravitational force against resistance, your bone will slowly demineralize over time. It will become less and less dense as a result of inactivity. And then the next issue or the next thing is, is really is to look at if you're eating gluten because they're, they're, we know that gluten can cause a form of autoimmune bone loss. And so no amount of calcium or mineral supplementation is going to fix that diet that, that change that may need to happen for you. So get tested, make sure you get genetically tested to see whether or not gluten's playing a role in your bone issue. Let's see, I think I answered that one. There was another question about 
tonsil stones. And tonsil stones, in my experience, are one of the most common causes of tonsil stones is food allergy. And I've seen a lot of tonsil stones be caused as a result of gluten exposure. Okay, let's see. Can you make sourdough from the warrior bread mix? Kim wants to know. I don't think we've ever tried to make sourdough, but I mean, you know, if you want to give it a try, maybe I'll talk to our to our chef and see if they'll give that a whirl. And I just I don't want you to spend the money and do it because we haven't tried it. So I don't want to tell you to try it um, and then you end up losing a batch. Uh, question about overcoming almond allergy. Can it happen? Can you overcome an almond allergy? Possibly. Um, a lot of food allergies or food sensitivities are not permanent. They're, they're what are known as transient or acquired allergies. And so it is possible. Now, if you're having acute reactions where your lips swell and your throat constricts and you end up in the hospital, probably not. But if you, if you have what's called a delayed hypersensitivity, then that is very possible, something you may be able to overcome. Um, let's see here. Question about topical ear antibiotics. Are they okay? I, again, I would say if you don't know whether the infection is being caused as a result of bacteria or yeast, you didn't know, I would, I would say you need to get with the doctor to get clarity on that especially if you're going on a third infection in two months. That generally means you're not, you're not attacking it in the, in the right way. You're, you're not going to win. You know the old saying, fool me once, uh, what is it? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And then going back for thirds, I mean, then who do we shame? So like get clarity. Um, what is the gold standard test to assess yeast in the body? So. There's not a gold standard because it depends on where you're trying to assess it, Ryan. Um, so, for example, if you're trying to assess yeast in the sinus cavities, a gold standard would be to do a culture and to make sure you try to grow that culture for upwards of three weeks. Cultures for yeast sometimes take a little bit longer to start manifesting. And a lot of times the, the lab will only culture the, the, the sample for a couple of days, and that's not long enough to get yeast growth in some cases. So in, in the sinuses, it's, it's a culture. In the GI tract, it's mass spec culture and microscopic evaluation. So there's multiple types of tests. If we're talking about systemic blood, the best way to determine whether or not you have antibodies that are reacting against yeast is to measure for those antibodies. But remember that presence of antibodies doesn't necessarily mean that you have an active blood infection, it could mean that your body is producing antibodies from past infection or past exposure and that you still have them. It's kind of like, think about it like COVID. A lot of people that had COVID are today still making antibodies, but they're not necessarily infected. Those are called protective antibodies. And the same thing can happen when you're trying to look at antibody testing in the blood. And a lot of doctors I see it being guilty of that, trying to diagnose yeast infections by looking at, at blood antibody levels, and that is not always the best way to go about it. So I quit gluten and all of my symptoms for colitis went away. Have you seen that a lot in your experience all the time? Um, so the end of my eyebrows are also gone. Is that why is that and is that reversible? Get your thyroid checked because you may have a, you know, a, a thyroid problem that's leading to that. The distal third of the eyebrows very commonly starts to, the eyebrows will start to recede from the, ex, from, the, from the outside in when there's a thyroid issue. And gluten can also cause thyroid issues, but getting your thyroid check would be a good first step there. I'm being tested for um, MCAS, I'm assuming you mean mast cell activation syndrome. Is your supplemental protein powder okay for that? Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, Amanda, we'll put up a link to our histamine. Uh, we have a very detailed article on histamine that might be helpful for you just to understand what is high in histamine and what is not. But yes, our protein uh, powders are suitable for those with histamine issues. I have heart palpitations daily. I take metoprolol for them. They're not as hard, but still have them often every single day. Cardiologist doesn't see anything wrong. Any ideas? Yeah, I mean, a lot of things. It could be calcium, could be magnesium deficiency. So I mean, mineral deficiency, electrolyte disturbance, electrolyte deficiency, food sensitivity, 
Um, those are just simple places that I would start looking. Cardiologists will never see it as a problem. I mean, that's the solution. That's, most mainstream doctors, what is the solution? The solution is hammer your symptoms with a pharmaceutical. And if your symptoms still completely don't go away, then, that, and then they usually change the pharmaceutical and then until they can find a winning combination. But, but you remember that mainstream medicine is not about root cause or origin cause. They're not looking for why, they're just looking for what they can hide. And that to me, that's, that's a bad idea. It's like sweeping dirt under the rug at home. Eventually the pile of dirt gets so big uh, that you can no longer continue to ignore it. And the same thing with your symptoms. You can't sweep your symptoms under the rug by medicating them forever. Your body is gonna rebel against you um, if you don't figure it out. Uh, my son was just diagnosed celiac a little over a year ago. He just turned 18. He stays away from gluten, but there are times he gets a reaction. Does dairy create a reaction? Yes, uh, Gene Anik certainly can create a reaction. What I would suggest you do, let's put the link up in, in the feed for Gene Ann on our Glutenology Masterclass. Um, I would highly encourage you to, to, to give this to your son. It's free. Either one of you can watch it. Um, but highly encourage you guys to watch the master class on gluten because if you were diagnosed or if he was diagnosed with celiac disease, I can, I can promise you what you're learning uh, in most places on the internet is very misleading. And, they, and, they, and some, of those, some of those things may be the reason why he still gets reactions from time to time. And I, you know, again, I think it'll help you nail that down. Okay, let's see. Could HPV dis could the HPV vaccine disrupt my cycle? Yes, it, it 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 has been shown to do that. A number of women have complained to that. And eczema as well. Yes, eczema is a form of autoimmune reaction. What can you do to detox? Um, I, I'd work with a practitioner. I'd work with somebody who understands um, vaccine detox. Uh, because it's not just like one simple thing that you you just take away and just go do right now. Um, uh, but there's some tests that you would probably want to get done to see what it is that, that you were injected with within that vaccine that might be contributing to that as well. Is genetic predisposition with gluten sensitivity symptoms but not found with endoscopy? Is celiac, okay, so if you have genetic predisposition to gluten and you don't have yet celiac disease uh, and you had an endoscopy and it was negative, is celiac disease waiting to happen? Maybe, not necessarily maybe. You have to understand one thing about gluten sensitivity. So we could say that if we're talking about celiac disease. Everyone with celiac disease is gluten sensitive. Okay, but then you have over here, you have gluten sensitivity. And so not everybody with gluten sensitivity will develop celiac disease. Some will, but not everyone will. There's a host of diseases that gluten can cause. I mean, there's, for example, there's a whole host of different types of neurological symptoms from neur simple neuropathies to uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis to Lou, or Lou Gehrig's disease to multiple sclerosis to diseases like schizophrenia or bipolar have all been linked to gluten exposure. So there's a whole kind of area around neurological damage. There's muscle disease that gluten can cause, um, and joint disease, so arthritis, like the autoimmune arthritis, like, like reactive arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis. There's skin manifestations of gluten, dermatitis herpetiformis, um, eczema, psoriasis, vitiligo, um, to name a few. So you've got, again, gluten can cause damage in multiple locations. It doesn't just have to cause the damage here. And in many people, it doesn't cause the damage here. It only causes the damage in these other areas. And this is why if you go to your doctor and get a biopsy, uh, having an upper endoscopy done and it comes back negative, it doesn't mean you're not gluten sensitive. It just means you have not developed villous atrophy on the date of that test. And so the other thing you have to understand about a biopsy is biopsies are flawed. You're, you're, um, they're accurate if they're positive. So they're very accurate. If you have villous atrophy and they find it, it's positive, okay? But you have to understand that the, the intestines, the small intestine is 22 foot long. And in that, in that regard, it's the surface area 
the same size as approximately a tennis court. So you know how big a tennis court is, right? You played tennis, you do. Um, and so imagine if we took a microscopic, tiny microscopic section of a tennis court, and we said this tiny microscopic section of a tennis court represents the whole tennis court. That would be false. And that's why biopsies are so flawed, because you're trying to say this is the, the small intestine as a whole, but what you're really doing is you're taking these tiny microscopic cross sections of an area and trying to say the entire area represents these tiny cross sections that we're trying to analyze. And that's, again, you get, I've had, I, I've had cases where people had had, the most I've seen is a woman had 10 biopsies before she got the 10th. The first nine were negative, the 10th was positive. But it took her, it was a 20 year process to get there. Do you want gluten to damage you for 20 years before you get an accurate diagnosis? This is why I like genetic testing, because you get genetic testing with your cheeks. You just swab your cheeks and you can get an answer and you don't, you know, you can find out about this and you don't have to wait the decades to find out that maybe this is happening because some people, this, they'll never find it. They'll never find it. They'll never get to that because again, gluten sensitivity doesn't just cause the damage associated with celiac, which is the villus atrophy. It can cause a lot of different types of problems and villus atrophy uh, sometimes doesn't happen at all. Um, does blood type have anything to do with gluten sensitivity? No, um, not at all in my, not at all in my experience. So, um, are white mushrooms the same as medicinal mushrooms? Are both considered nightshades? None, none of them are considered nightshades. Mushrooms are not nightshades. Nightshades are a, are a, a family. They're generally potatoes, peppers, eggplant, and tomatoes fit within the nightshade family. Mushrooms are not part of that family. So I don't, I don't know where you heard that from, but maybe somebody misled you there. What can we do to test for leaky gut? There, there, it's not one test, Kim. There, it's a number of different things that give us insight as to whether or not there's permeability in the, in the small or large intestine. So, um, you know, find a good doctor who can measure those things more than anything else. It's not, because it's not just one thing. Um, how do you get your supplements into something with when you have trouble swallowing? I like that question. That's a good question. We use we have people use their protein smoothies, and so because the protein, especially like if you're using our ultra pure protein, it's so delicious. Now you know I hate to if you're not for who if you're not for you who will be, but I think we designed it so well. It's so good tasting that it masks a lot of uh, supplements. You know if you break them up and you try to just take them in water, the, the taste can be quite foul. But if you mix them and you puree them into food or into a smoothie, I'm partial to, to um, ultra pure protein. To do that, that would be very easy to help you swallow it. Um, so that's that that's how we get around that. And generally speaking, you got to make sure when you're buying them. You buy them in the in the gel caps that can twist, and the powder can be dumped into it. Now, if it's like a if it's like a fish oil type of fat, you can puncture that, and you can squeeze that, or you can buy a liquid version. And then there are also powdered versions of some supplements as well that you can mix with water. But you have to be careful of a lot of those because they're full of corn fillers and other sugars and artificial sweeteners that aren't good for you. Suggestions for four-month post-COVID ear pressure, cracking, clogged ears. Yeah, get your ears adjusted. Find a good chiropractor who knows how to adjust the ears. You might have a eustachian tube that's blocked, and getting that ear adjusted might help open that up um, post-infection. A uh, question about whether or not we've gotten our testing on our website sorted uh, and ready to go yet. So we're very, very close with food sensitivities. I'm hoping to have that ready here in the next uh, month or so. We're already up and uh, available. You can already get gluten sensitivity testing. And the nutrition deficiencies is coming. We're working out a few kinks, and we'll have that uh, ready to go soon. Can re autoimmune disease be reversed once you have it? Teresa is asking. Absolutely, it can be. And anybody who tells you otherwise, seek a second opinion. Um, most of the doctors I, I see that, tell their, that they tell their patients that autoimmune disease is non-reversible and you have to learn to live with it. 
it's, it's because what they're doing doesn't work. And so they're going to share their experience with you, which is a lack of, of improvement, right? Um, not necessarily a lack of improvement, but a lack of resolution because the only mechanism in medicine to, to address autoimmune disease is immunosuppression, which is a terrible idea if you don't want to get cancer. Um, immunosuppression is a bad way to get uh, a bad way to get the cancer. It might work temporarily for your autoimmune symptoms, but generally it, it, it doesn't have great outcomes in the long run. I was told by a nurse practitioner to eat yams instead because um, I'm menopausal. Will that help? Will, will it help what? So, I mean, generally yams are okay if you're following no grain, no pain. Yams are perfectly fine. Um, but some people, again, with yeast overgrowth, particularly yams can be um, problematic and still create some bloating and intestinal discomfort. So if you experience that, obviously you want to back, it, you want to back out on those. My grandmother has celiac and my chance, are my chances greater for gluten sensitivity? Absolutely. We, there have been a number of studies, Terry, on uh, first and second degree relatives of people with celiac disease and the, and the risks are sky high. Because, again, it's genetic. Um, let's see here. I'm gluten sensitive. I also have Sjogren's. At times I have terrible pain in the lower back and neck. I'm gluten free. Is there anything that you could uh, think could cause my inflammation to be increased to try to eat whole food? Kate, have you watched our, our master class on going gluten-free? Because a lot of times when people tell me I'm gluten-free, they're not. And it's not for any other reason than they just don't understand fully the definition of what gluten is. And so they're getting gluten exposure to foods that are being called gluten-free, but they're technically still not gluten-free. That would be the first thing I would encourage you to do. Um, outside of that, you might also have other food sensitivities or food reactions. And so getting with your doctor to, to see if he'll test you for those would be a good idea as well. Um, let's see here. Is intermittent fasting safe for somebody with osteoporosis? Of course. Um, intermittent fasting is just, is just meal restricting in a certain time window. It's not calorie restricting, so it's perfectly safe for somebody with osteoporosis. Um, Uh, let's see, Raj was asking, what was the Omega discount code? I think it's Omega. I think just Omega, the word Omega when you check out, if you want to save on our uh, premium different blends of Omega-3 fatty acids. They're very highly concentrated. Is it safe to eat non-organic melons, pineapples when in growing season? I mean, you're going to get pesticide exposure for sure. And many people will say that the skin is thick, therefore the exposure is less. I don't agree with that. If they spray the ground with pesticide, have you ever seen melons grow? They grow on the ground, and that ground is contaminated with pesticide. That soil is contaminated with pesticide. That soil is going to pull the pesticide into it and push it into the plant itself, into the flesh. So, you know, they, a, lot of, a lot of places on the internet, you'll read about these lists like the Dirty Dozen and like, and I, I don't agree with that. I don't think that, I think you should buy organic explicitly, and I don't think you should eat it if it's not organic, if you don't want to get poison exposure. I, I, that's just my, my take on it. Um, can gluten be hidden in vitamins? It, oh man, yes, Grace, absolutely. Actually, I, what's crazy is I see brands of vitamins that are labeled gluten-free that have gluten in them. That's how bad the vitamin industry is. I actually, somebody, one of my clients this morning reached out to my office and said, I can't believe how much gluten I found in my vitamins after talking with you. I mean, they went home and found it. It was in a, a good majority of the products that they were taking that were labeled gluten-free. And they were already noticing improvements just by not taking the poison. See, the vitamin can be good for you but if it's also poisoning you, it's not going to be super good for you. But it's very common for there to be gluten in a number of vitamin supplements. That's why at Gluten-Free Society, we've, we've taken such painstaking efforts to make sure you have products that aren't going to poison you, right? That are not going to, you, you've got enough to navigate within the diet of trying to go gluten-free and figuring that out that you need to worry about your supplements or other uh, or, or, or other health products you, that you're worried about, need to worry about cross-contamination there. 
Are there conditions under which intermittent fasting is dangerous? Yeah, if you're type 1 diabetic, you've got to really be careful and watch, you know, where your blood sugar is going. Um, and that's, you know, for your insulin dependent diabetic, or if you have severe erratic up and down blood sugar swings. And so for some people fasting in that intermittent, even intermittent fasting, at least at first might not be the best idea. If you fall in that category, it's sometimes it's a good idea to just have somebody monitor you when you go through a fast. But most people tolerate intermittent fasting pretty well. Why does vitamin A keep me from sleeping? Um, you know, there may be a, a, an excipient in the vitamin A or something in there that's, that's keeping you awake. I, I, you know, there's not, that's not a side effect typically of vitamin A. Vitamin A doesn't typically cause trouble sleeping for people. So I, my advice would be to look at the other ingredients in the product and maybe you're getting exposure to something you didn't know. Let's go down on both sides. Okay. It's impossible to be, it's not impossible to be 100% gluten free. It's very possible. Um, let's don't spread that hopelessness. I, I think what it is, is it's, um, it's impossible to participate in society today the way society wants you to participate and maintain a gluten-free lifestyle because you're going to eventually get cross-contamination or somebody's going to feed you gluten on purpose or whatever the case might be. But it is not impossible to be 100% gluten-free. I'm there every day. Uh, let's see here. Oh, the cereals. That's a whole nother deal, isn't it? Um, Steven, I just did a whole deal on cereal. I just did a whole big article on that. If we can throw that link up. Uh, from gluten-free society. Those of you who maybe are new, if you're if you're not familiar, you should really, um, after the show, go go check out glutenfreesociety.org. That's my hub, if you will. It's where we have everything you want to know about going gluten-free. And if you if you can't find information about it, reach out to me. Um, you know, we we we're here to serve you guys and here to answer your questions and help you navigate your gluten-free diet. Uh, with ease. And so we did an entire thing on gluten-free cereals. Um, so most of them that lay are labeled gluten-free are absolutely not gluten-free. I mean, there was a, I think it was a, I can't remember, don't quote me, a 21 million box recall of General Mills cereals not too long ago. Um, you know, been a number of recalls on cereals because they're cross-contaminated or they're just technically they're not gluten-free. So fasting and getting super sick and horrible headache, you've got blood sugar problems, uh, Chelsea, and, and there are a number of reasons why that could be the case. I see a lot of times, uh, one of the common things I see is, is chromium deficiency. If somebody's chromium deficient, they can't, it's harder for them to regulate their blood sugar, and so fasting might send them into ups and downs, and that can generate headaches. So that may be something that you, that you look into. Okay, I think we're at, at time here. We're 15 minutes over, so. All right, I'm gonna go home and eat dinner. And uh, thanks for spending your Monday evening with me. I hope you found this information helpful. Look, if you're not subscribed, head over to glutenfreesociety.org. Make sure you subscribe to my newsletter. It's right there front and center on the homepage. Just type in your name and email. And that's the way we can make sure that you get updates about when we go live uh, and you don't get censored. We're getting tons of feedback about the massive amount of censorship, meaning that YouTube is no longer telling our subscribers when we go live or, or they're, 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 they're kind of minimizing it, right? And the, the same thing is happening on, on some of the other social media channels though. Although we are still pushing out to social media channels, we're, um, we're also working on a solution where we're no longer gonna, gonna rely on the social media channels to censor us and we're gonna do raw uncut versions over at glutenfreestudy.org. So make sure you go sign up there if you want the future of un uh, uncensored, raw Dr. Osborne. I'm, I'm a little reserved, um, you know, because I just want to make sure that our platforms stay abreast until we can make that transition. So if you want to get a Dr. Osborne in the raw, make sure you come subscribe. Uh, have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Uh, hope you sleep well and uh, get healthy. Take care. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. 
bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is going to allow us to remind you right before we go live. But it's also going to allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long, and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.